in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity, says Albert Einstein. This is also a favorite quote from my guest today from Vietnam, Sophie Ha Tu Muyen. And welcome to the Blueprint Asia podcast, and I'm your host, Krista Gun. We are listening to season two, where I speak to more inspiring yet down to earth women in business across Asia. And this episode is sponsored by Rebo Studio. In this episode, I'm speaking to Sophie Ha Tu Muyen from Vietnam, who is the co founder and CEO of Scabella. Hers is an interesting story because her business, Scabella, is a line of children's clothing that was particularly hit hard during the pandemic. As stores were shut in Ho Chi Minh City, her retail fashion wear for children was badly affected. She first felt deeply frustrated but decided that she would do something instead of moping about at home. Not only did she manage to do something positive for her children's fashion business, but she also created a new business as well as joined forces with a friend to work through this storm. She came out stronger and now even has the time to coach and motivate her team. Now, some of the highlights of her interview include how she convinced high-end department stores to retail her children's fashion in the early days when no one had heard of her brand. Why she turned out investors was Scabella, even though she had every opportunity to take the money and grow the brand. How she managed to cut her costs during the pandemic without firing anyone and even managed to give them all bonuses at the end of last year. And she used to go to the office three to four days a week, and now she only goes in for half a day. And having all this extra time made her take up a coaching certification. She's now a certified coach who combines her love for fashion into a new business, Dress for Success, which is an image consulting business for women in corporate and business. Sophie Ha has managed to combine her experience and expertise to not only sustain her business, but to grow a new one as well. In that process, she also grew a partnership with her friend. Enjoy this conversation of ours that may help you spark off some useful business ideas too. Welcome to the Womenpreneur Asia, Sophie. Hi, Krista. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. And where are you today, Sophie? Um, I'm at home now um, after the COVID pandemic, so I tend to work at home most of the time. And your physical location? Which city are you in or which country? I'm living now in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I like to ask my guests when they come on my podcast is that they are very entrepreneurial. So when and how did your entrepreneurial journey begin? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Honestly, I don't know when, when it started. But I remember when I graduated from university, I worked for an NGO in Vietnam. Uh, this is kind of government NGO. Uh, so, but still in my mind, I still have some thought in mind that someday I may do business. But I don't know what kind of business, what industries. I just have a little, little dream in my mind that I want to do business someday. That's it. And then at that time, there is no uh, mentor or for career management. And there are no senior people that I can ask because more of my parents' friends, they also work for their own companies. And, and we don't have really, we don't really have friends in business. So, and maybe I don't, I didn't cover, discover maybe, and I, I didn't have someone to ask. And then I just go with the flow. I work for NGO and I have a dream in mind that someday I will do business. And how many years? I think about 10 years later, <laughs> that idea become true. What was your first business? My first business uh, was a children fashion brand. Um, I started this when I was still with the bank. Um, on a business trip to Singapore to meet one of my old friends. So uh, we catch up and um, have a long conversation about one hour or so in the city, in, in the center of Singapore. After we uh, ask each other, how are you, how, uh, how you have been doing with the work, blah, blah. And then, uh, and then both of us start saying, uh, let's do something together. And then we all say, yeah. <laughs> but, and the next question is, what kind of business we can do? And my friend says, that I cannot do anything except fashion because she has a talent in designing. 
And before she moving to US and then Singapore, she had a, a fashion brand in Vietnam, and uh, it was quite successful back at that time. And she told me that I didn't know uh, what to do uh, besides fashion. So I said, okay, so let's do fashion. But the difference is now we became become moms already. So instead of the woman life, so we do children life, and then everything started from there. So is that your uh, Scabella brand? Yeah, it is. But the original name is Sweetie Lovey. Uh, but later on, I I found out that like I cannot very difficult for me to register for um, intellectual property, and the name uh, is also very difficult to pronounce for Vietnamese people. Uh, and it makes them confused. A lot of people they really like my brand. And they introduce with a lot of their friends. And then they introduce me, uh, oh, she's the owner of Swiss Love. <laughs> Swiss Love. <laughs> and then one day I was in the interview board with the um, UK consultant in Ho Chi Minh City. And before we sit together to interview candidate, he learned so much about me through his uh, staff. And during the interview, he's had very fluent introduction about me. This is uh, Miss Sophie. Uh, she is an active member of blah, blah, blah. And we are very proud of her. She is the owner of children brand Swiss Delovey. And to the second uh, candidate, he's introduced in the same way. But and then he said, uh, uh, Swiss Delovey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So different, different names. Different yeah, names came out. Name. And actually, this is the really moment I think I really need to change the name. I had the thinking for some time, but I, because of many reasons, a procedure, and I cannot make up, make up my mind because I kind of lazy and I, I'm afraid of like legal procedure, that kind of thing. And I try to find an excuse to delay. But after that time, I said, okay, it's enough. <laughs> And then because even, people are confused, confusing yeah, your name. When you speak, they cannot really properly speak it out. So I have to change. And then it takes quite a while for me to think of a new name. Uh, uh, that need to uh, meet three requirements. Firstly, you have to be able to find a domain, right? To buy a domain. Yes. And then you have to test with whether or not um, you can register for intellectual property and the third one it needs to be easy to remember for the market where you focus on and then we come up with a scabella name and scabella is a combination of two words scab and bella uh, scab in uh, denmark is mean wardrobe and oh. bella all around the world you know it is beautiful right so yeah i met the two words because uh, Denmark is so like a fairy land, a, a land of fairy tale, right? So uh, it really connects to children. So I choose a uh, Den Den Denmark words uh, with a uh, international word, with, and we make it up Scabella. And so far, I think uh, we have a good name. Um, it may sound a bit lonely, but that's fine. But at least people remember it, and people love it. <laughs> Can people yeah. um now remember and say it without confusing yeah. other people? Yeah. It's even for Vietnamese people, for people who don't know English, they still can speak it very easily. Remember it easily. Yeah. Yeah. It is a very easy to remember name Scabella. And yeah. uh, when you first started Scabella, uh, how do you uh, market or where do you market the children's clothes? Ah, uh, it's a very interesting story. You know, at first, um, my friend and I think, uh, oh, let's do e-commerce because I I was so naive there. I think that e-commerce, like we saw everything online, we didn't um, have to invest a lot. And then I still can do corporate uh, work and then do my own business at the same time. And then we, um, we set up the company in Singapore. Because at that time, my business partner is based in Singapore with her family. And we set up a company in Singapore. We use a very updated um, system at that time. It's called Marcento. And um, we sell in Singapore. 
we didn't have the stop yes to start at that time, but we uh, participated in a lot of um, expat uh, fair in a five star hotel in in Holland Air, right? The Holland Air Club in Singapore, and in, in Wilton Hotel, a lot of hotel, and um, in Vietnam. Because of the system is to advance to Vietnam at that time, so it's so difficult for me to plug with any other system available in the market. And we didn't do much in Vietnam. We just do some very small retails in Singapore. And about um, nearly two years later, uh, my my business partner, uh, she brought her family back to Vietnam because her husband got a very good offer in Vietnam. And also her children um, to the age uh, that they go to primary school, and she wanted her children to know how to speak native uh, language, right? And then she sent back her family to Vietnam so that her children can really study Vietnamese and English at the same time. And then we think like, okay, maybe uh, Vietnamese market also very potential. Let focus on the domestic stuff before we. Uh, we go beyond the order, uh, the border, and then we focus on Vietnam market land. And as time goes by, as I just said, so we change the name to Scabella. Uh, but actually, the back end, the business, um, the philosophy keep unchanged. Yeah. So yeah. in that way, you were selling in retail in Vietnam. You uh, put it in the stores, or you open your own store. Yeah, I thought we, um, we uh, at the beginning, it was so difficult to really get in department store because they have a lot of requirements we have to meet. And the most uh, important requirement is that you, do you have any store somewhere else so that we can have and uh, we can go there to, and have a look? And then we didn't have any um, any saw at that time, and so we um, we um, set up some pop up saw in uh, some department saw at that time in Vietnam. The first one in in Diamond Plaza. I don't know if you've been there before when you were in Ho Chi Minh City, but um, at that time Diamond is one of the biggest department store in Ho Chi Minh City at that time. So we have a few pop up store in the children related occasion then. And um, when Takashimaya uh, opened in Vietnam, uh, the fact that they already known, uh, already knew my brand, so they invited me to uh, to to open our first store in Takashimaya, and the story started from there. So from the beginning, when you met your friend in Singapore, and you had the idea to start a business together. Until you uh, had your retail outlet in uh, the shopping mall, yeah. How many years was that? Like from the beginning till you, yeah. yeah. Let me calculate a bit. I don't really remember. <laughs> yeah. What year was that when you first had the idea to start the business? I started the business in two thousand thirteen, and that two months later, when we actually. That one day uh, after we took the first photo shoot, I um, recognized that I got pregnant. Wow. <laughs> what an auspicious <laughs> occasion yeah. for you. Yeah, and my business partner, she said, oh, it's so soon. And then she, from Singapore, she had to fly back many times as that year to help me out because like, I almost met dress during my pregnancies. And more of my family family members, they can really work out with the fabric, you know, <laughs> on behalf of me. And um, and I really back to the business nearly a year after I gave birth and also the pregnancy time. Uh, and I think that Casimia is open in 2015, meaning two years later. So yeah. that, that was quite fast. That was yeah. quite Thank you fast. Remind me. Like I even don't remember now. I make calculation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So so what happened after that? I mean, okay, so now you have your store uh, selling in, in Takashimaya and all that. So what was the uh, business like for you then in 2015? Uh, in, in 2015, it is really good because like 
Takasumiya, together with Taipan Center, is one of the largest shopping malls a shopping mall in Ho Chi Minh City at that time. And for Ho Chi Minh City people, they are very curious about the new things. So when something new opens up, they will go and discover. And our revenue go boom. <laughs> and yeah. And the number is was amazing then. So everything goes really smooth. Um, but as time goes by, there is more new things. Um, happening in the city and people tend to switch to the new thing that's that's really the habit of the people living in my city they are very curious with the new thing in a good way and of course uh because of this now the traffic in uh, the shopping mall uh, uh re were reducing were reducing a bit and our revenue was affected um but at the same time we have a plan to expand our business And I work um, a lot uh, to call for the investment from the investment fund. And um, when we were in Hawaii together in 2019, right? Um, yeah. you, uh, you guys go out, went out a lot, but I <laughs> spent time to work. <laughs> At the whole to, to on your grants, on your grants and the yeah. financial assistance. Yeah, I work on the presentation to make presentation for to the investor during our time in Hawaii, in Hawaii, and I'm the only uh person who make the speed online 100%. Why in Vietnam most of people they gather in a conference room and they make presentation and they receive fun, but I did it from Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah, yeah, Hawaii. Do you get? Do Do you get it? Do you get it? Yeah, we did. We did. And then wow. when I came, when I um, uh, came back to the country, I also flew out to Hanoi to uh, have some negotiation with them. But finally, I decided that like I didn't take that investment. Uh, the reason is that like it's called the venture fund, but all the term and condition are so trick. And I see that. It even trickier than the loan from the bank. So I asked myself, what is the reason I I need to I need to choose the venture fund? Yeah, if I tell, meaning that they must have very um, strong people, strong team. Maybe I can learn something from there, and I speed up my growth. Uh, but things that are not really convincing me, and at the same time, I also want to keep my lifestyle. Because I understand if I will see investment, I back to the corporate world again, or it's even worse. And that's what I didn't want to at that time. So I, we didn't really uh, came to an end and I continue with my, uh, my own journey. So I didn't really rely on them. So last year, I, I, uh, 2019, actually at the end of 2019, um, in, in, in November, I opened up uh, the second store in Hanun, in Latte Shopping Mall. But unluckily, because of the COVID, so things become really bad after a few months. And uh, by the end of last year, I decided I closed um, Hanun store because I first saw that like the COVID situation in this year It's not going to be better, so I think I decided that I, I, I really minimize my retail business, and at the same time I look for other opportunity. So I must uh, with another brand, uh, this is wholesale brand from my friend, and we. Is this together. the same friend? Is this the same friend? No, right? It's a different friend. No, no different brand. <laughs> friend actually this is a friend we used to work together sometime in the past and i already invited her to join my business but um, at that time she said that she want to do something for herself so that she doesn't need to report and to um uh, um to focus too much on kpis that kind of thing and after two years she launched her own company she understand that it's not that easy and then during the covid pandemic Everything, particularly in government and textile industries, becomes so difficult. And then we sit, we sat down and talk, and we decided that we're gonna merge two brands. And I restructure our our Scabella a bit, 
and then we welcome the new brand and we actually use the same uh, human resource. But we work for two brands together and we create much more revenue and things become much better. Actually, actually because of the COVID pandemic, so I see kind of the progress, the development for my business. So I'm actually, I'm quite proud and happy about it. <laughs> I, I remember, I remember when we, we met in Ho Chi Minh and um, you were telling me about, uh, that was just like the start of the pandemic, right? Yeah. And we were all talking about it. And I remember you were telling me, go and watch this Korean drama. <laughs> Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. You, because you were watching Crash Landing on you and you yeah. said, oh, so interesting. But uh, I have so much of time right now. I don't know what to do. So I am watching this drama and you should watch it too. And I was like, okay, uh, that's very interesting. But eventually I, I never had the time to look into it, but I know you were very into the drama. So wow. I, I recall that time. I believe that was a, a slightly dark moment for you because at that time it was yeah. just a start. Yeah. Um, and how, how do you feel at that time when it was just around March, April and, you know, you you couldn't open your stores, right? <laughs> In the mall. Yeah. And, and nobody could go out. So how, how did that feel? And until now, and then there's something else that happened. So I would like to also talk about that uh, I know that right now you are in a, such a good place so yeah. I want you to talk about what happened in March April and how something else came up after that let's let me think a bit about you know, how I felt at that time in general for for me um in the difficulties uh, situation I am um, I am quite calm I calm and uh, because of the COVID, it started in December, I think, and it became spread in about January during the new year, right? In, 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 in Asia at that time, and I was on a holiday, on holiday, uh, and things changed so fast. And then when I came back, so things become slow and then cropping more is close. And I don't know how long it's going to take uh, for the store to be reopened. So I have not to do, nothing to do at that time. So that's why I go to Netflix. We <laughs> are family. We set up Netflix for quite a while and I didn't spend much time to watch anything. And for K-drama itself, though I received a lot of comments from my friends and I refused to watch it. <laughs> I say, oh, God, I, don't, I don't need to spend time on this. So it's crap. And um, cross landing on you uh, pop up at that time when I was totally free. I say, okay, let's try to see how it is. And then I watched this movie in about two days' time, you know, <laughs> 16 episodes. Wow. Super, <laughs> super record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really, I wake up to like, at first, 3 a.m. and then 4 a.m. and then 5 a.m. And then I guess you to the time, new time light. But when I see the sun start going up and then I go to sleep. <laughs> but after one or two um, uh, movie uh, film, right? So I think like, okay, I need to do something. So I spend time. Um, I really take time to think through what's going on right now and is anything I need to do. And within just a few days, I restructure the company straight away. Um, I uh, return a part of my office to the landlord you know, with the term that I don't need to pay anything more. I just cut it up and then to solve uh, some, ex uh, some expense. Actually, a few months before that, I asked them to um, rent another room so to prepare for the expansion period. And then <laughs> after a few months, because of COVID, I returned it. But the landlord was so nice, so they accepted it. And then uh, I trained I train the office 
and also I I reach out to a bit about a human resource to make it more efficient. I don't uh, find anyone, but I reach out to in the ways that it works better. And during the lock, lockdown time, so uh, I allow my staff to bring computer home so that they can work at home if they uh, need it. Uh, and that's it. So after, I think in Vietnam, we locked down for about three or four weeks and then uh, things become become normal and the stores open again. But at that time, we already um, um, welcome the new brand already. So we have a lot of things to do at that time already. And then, and then we focus on the uh, B2B business. That is... Um, we have a, a new brand called Salino. This is the wholesale uh, brand focused on providing uniform, design a uniform for four-star four and five-star hotel and resource. Uh, and uniform to, co- uh, to corporate and also for international uh, school. And though the uh, economy is really going down, but there's few organizations, they need new uniform for their staff. And then we still have um, others uh, to do. So I um, think uh, we, we really take the B2B business to recover uh, some loss that we have for, for B2C. But uh, uh, by for the, the Scabella, way, all right, to, yeah, to yeah. cover for the Scabella brand. Yeah. 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 So um, now we, in, in this year, we try to maintain the Scabella and we focus more on the Salino side. And still, uh, every month we have uh, enough order to do. Uh, it, it's not too bad. And the thing, um, the interesting that I found out last year, by the end of the last year, the last year is during the COVID pandemic, I didn't reduce any salary of my staff. And by the end of the year, I had more bonus for them than last year. <laughs> wow. What, what, what a, what a uh, story of hope. I think. That was something which I like a lot, which I felt that one, you didn't cut any of your staff out from Mm. the team. And two, you maintain their salaries. Uh, And three, they they got a bonus. Yeah. (laughs) I I, I forgot to tell you uh, previously, that's actually one of my restructure is that during the COVID pandemic, actually I reduced some salary. But I didn't cut it. Uh, I told my staff that because now it's really in difficult situation. So I will temporarily um, keep 20% of the salary to recover some expenses we have now while we don't have sufficient revenue to cover it up. And then when the company um, operates uh, again and become working uh and become better, I will repay you. Uh, that's the amount. And actually, in December this year, I already repay everything to them. And then we have a certain surplus amount. And then I decided that now they work very hard. Instead of one brand, they two do brands. So they deserve uh, a recognition and reward. So that's why I give them a little bit uh, more bonus than last year. So that's they like really. Um, understand uh, how much they are rewarded by on what they already contributed. And I feel very thankful for the um, loyalty, the faithfulness of my, of my staff. Um, through the difficulties uh, more of periods, I really see the value uh, they have and the value we have built so far. And we, we kind of stick together during the difficult time Instead of we saying goodbye or we uh uh or let we go let go, go of the staff yeah 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 and I see more much more quality for my my staff you know, because of that event because now they become very independent. Before I went to the office about three to four days per week, and now I went to the office and I go to the office about half a day per week. So it, it is amazing. <laughs> So you have more time for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Which means that which means that yeah. your more time is a good thing, right? I mean, I, I do hope more time is a good thing and you're not watching K-drama. Uh, no, no, I'm busy again. <laughs> so t- tell us, okay, what are you busy with now? Uh, so 
after the COVID, right? Not really after the COVID. This one, I restructured my company already. I acquired one more brand. We work for two brands. I still have kind of plenty of free time. So I think I need to do something else. And then I spend time. I study um, some um, uh, some course to get the certificate on coach. On coach. So now I'm officially become a coach, international certified coach, and um, I coach business. And at that time, I become I create a new um, uh, a new course called Track for Success. So I also the trainer and the the coach for this course. So we I started the course in October, and in October we have one course. November we have another, and December we we have another one in Hanoi. Uh, in Hanoi, and um, uh, and now we can we are preparing for the new course, two new course in March. Yeah. Okay. So what what do you do uh, when you say you coach and train under this new brand called Dress for Success? Uh, who who are your target market first of all? What what do you do and what do you train or coach on? Uh, during the COVID pandemic, I I uh, I found that a lot of people they feel lost. They feel lost. Because they didn't prepare themselves for difficult situation, and um, uh, a part, a major reason of that, because I think they don't know who they are, they don't know who they are, and they don't know how to show up, how to show the, uh, themselves to the world. And I created a new uh, course, focus on helping them to improve their personal branding and guide them how to present themselves, how to present themselves well in front of people uh, through uh, the way they uh, create their own style and they know how to dress well to attract a new business opportunity. So that's the reason why the Dread for Success course uh, were created. But you also have a different... Um how should I say, a, a little bit of a difference, right? Because there are a lot of people uh, teaching about presenting themselves well. But in your case, you probably would have a little extra that they are looking for when they come to you and attend your courses. But what do you think that uniqueness about your course or what you teach? Yeah, the different, the different thing is that... Um, I came to this point. Uh, I I have been passed through a lot of different kind of job and experience, and also in the leadership role for quite a while. And I understand that uh, the appearance is important, but it will not sustain as long if you unless you really connect with the internal value the inner values so um and i and i think that um students they can learn deep and trick about the beauty and style somewhere else on the internet very easily now today and it doesn't make sense if i provide any course that people can fight somewhere somewhere else so i really use my own experience during the year so that i share what i've been through and how i really upgrade progress with my life uh to my students and one and i always tell them that don't decide to follow any style until you and you can answer who you are and who you want to be and I believe that not every pupil uh, uh, explain this concept in the same way because it relies much on their own experience to help people. And um, when I created the workbook for, and the presentation for the course, to be honest with you, I didn't really reference to any similar course from my else because I'm afraid that if I look into the course, my mind will be influenced by things I already read. And I just based on what I observe, I, what I think people are, lack of, uh, are lacking of. So I create something to really fulfill the pain, to help they overcome the pain. And 
And luckily, that during our course, I discovered that um, the content that I created myself to become the most favorite part of the course, this is personal branding. Yeah, and for the styling about body form, knowledge about body form, about color, they like it, but actually they can learn it somewhere else. But like for the personal branding, I really come one to one, so that they really have an answer right after the course. So it's not easy for them to get it somewhere else, and they really appreciate it. And I'm also feel very happy and proud of what I have done because the the biggest thing that I think I can do is that like. I don't compare me to anyone else. I just focus on what I can really provide. And by the end of the day, I I create something new and people like it. Before this, about this one year ago, I don't believe in this kind of concept, you know. Uh, a lot of books, they say like, oh, don't compare you to someone else because like it kind of limits your own uh, capability. So I say, oh, I think it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really good cool because you know, uh, we we know that if we want to be successful, like it's very good strategy that we learn a successful model somewhere else, and then we kind of copy it and adapt it with the new environment, and then you create something new. And then when I read it somewhere else, I don't remember where I get it, but I think it's crap. And but until I do this uh, this course that I'm doing now, so I I just try and then things go in exactly the way <laughs> the, the saying uh, that I read. So so I So now mean, you believe it. Now you believe it. <laughs> I, I find it's very interesting. I said, oh okay, finally I make it <laughs> I make it the way I didn't believe it at the beginning. Yeah. So it really kind of changed my sight and now I also um, tell my um my staff about it. I don't know how much they really absorb. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see <laughs> next year see the result next year and we we will know. <laughs> well, what are some of your um uh, best stories from from teaching this dress for success uh, course? Do you have any interesting stories from that? Any of your uh, outstanding <laughs> uh, students? Anything that you felt that they had a a good transformation or a really uh, it showed them something something new, something really interesting for them. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the question that that's I I I ask myself every day to be honestly because I always I really obsessed obsessed with what I can really provide to my student to my pupil, and I keep thinking about it every day. And from what I observe, I find that there are two groups of the students, of the alumni students, right? Once they trans transform very well, the other group, they don't transform really well. And it took me quite a while to find an answer why. And then I go and talk to people, to, I mean, to my students. Because some people, they transform more than the other. What is the reason behind? And then I find out that uh, the reason is that what you learn is important, but you need to practice because you cannot train yourself if you don't really want to do it. The teacher or the trainer is only showing you the way, but you have to spend time to practice it and you have to pursue what you want to be in the future. And I got a very good compliment from my student who transformed well. That they said that they transform and and they feel very happy uh, with their life now. And even some of the, my 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 students, uh, they said that um, their friend they didn't know her much, but you know, comment her that now they see her changing in a good way. She seemed very independent in life and she knows what she needs to in future before they didn't feel that but the reason because they my student now see through the track process set no it's more about appearance but i really connect her uh, to the inner value and they once she connects with her inner value she knows where she will go to in the future so she she just go, she just go in, um, in the way with the objectives she has in mind and she 
she becomes so independent and so this means in life and people can feel her energy. And another example was I have a student, she's nearly 45 years old, and one of her objectives, like dress well, blah, 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 and uh, to find a prince <laughs> this year. <laughs> and um, at first, I didn't believe much in that, um, how to say, in that hope, uh, in that, um, yeah, in that stream. But and then it put me uh, surprised because she's she very active um, and very um, uh, hard working with what she has. Um, Uh, what she have learned and she very uh, my heart is person from inside when you talk to her she can feel uh, you can feel that very easily but maybe before she doesn't know how to show up her inner beauty to outside and after the course you know and she also focused more on on um, garments and on the makeup and on the beauty in general and she transform a lot and people uh, People can see it very obviously, and she always surprised me in the in 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 terms of discrimina- uh, determination that she has uh, toward that stuff. Like, and I'm very happy for her, and I think like very soon or this year, so I may have a good news from her about <laughs> about getting her dream <laughs> guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So now I want to um, ask you about some of the challenges uh in your businesses because i know you have uh well technically you have two businesses one is the fashion business and one is this coaching and training business so when you started uh do you see any challenges or do you see any uh issues or concerns uh, when you first started or was it like really smooth sailing I mean, I heard the the one about Scabella, but what about this one? What about this dress for success? You know, I never believe in smooth sailing in life. In anything. In whatever I do, I never believe in that because I, I believe that there are no such thing. Um, but because, I think because I'm thinking in that way, I'm very optimistic people, right? And then I I don't define it as the difficulties. I define it that that's the way you need to face it and you need to overcome it in order to be successful. And now uh, for my fashion business now, the retail is still very difficult. And what I'm my objective this year is very simple. Uh, the revenue cover expense. That is. And for my B two B business, I know I can get profit from there. So in terms of personal business, that's enough for me. Um, at least in this situation, where a lot of small and medium sized companies they close, we still can survive and we make some profit. And that's good. And uh, all of my staff they can get a job. They still can live their life uh, and. Now I spend a lot of time to train and to coach them as well because I have more free time. So I change uh, the way I manage my company. So now I empower all of my staff. They do things uh, in their own way. So I, I encourage like an accountant become a cheap accountant and then CFO. I say like, you think that you are cheap accountant, you are CFO and you do whatever you think that's good for company, you do it. I'm behind the back. I support you, and you can add me whatever you want, and I will find the way to help you. That's the only thing I do for my company, right? So I I really empower every single position in my company, and now that's the way we work now. And every week, I um, I provide a coaching section or training section. It's about one hour. Whatever thing I see in the Uh, in the company uh, that I think uh, it, it, it can become better. I will pick the topic and I talk to my staff every week. So every week uh, we come up with different topics. Uh, sometimes it can be time management. The other time it's problem solving. The other time it can be simple how to say no to the customer. Uh, that's kind of how, to become, uh, how to overcome crisis. Uh, or in the other time I teach them Uh, product life cycle or human life cycle so that they can understand the customer better. Um, yeah, that's 
that's the way I manage the factory company now. Um, and I empower people. I provide them with more knowledge and I coach them. Because after eight to 10 hours in office, they become so tired. Though before I encourage them a lot to self-study, but they cannot do it. I say, okay, you don't do it. I do it for you now. <laughs> so, so now that you are a certified coach, right? You can go yeah. in and coach and train them. Yeah. yeah I, can, so- I can see how I can see how all your different interests and passions come together <laughs> to complement each other. The fashion business, uh, the I- coaching business. Yeah, the coaching business is really what I want to do in the long term. So, but same as the fashion uh, business, I think, uh, oh, later on, I want to do something that I can share knowledge with people. Um, I, I want to do, uh, I want to make a legacy so that like when I'm not there, people still remember me. Uh, a boss, I really had them. And that always, the, that's my set always come up in, uh, with me in whatever I do. So back to the uh, dreadful success, I think uh, because we are new, of course, there's still a lot of challenging waiting for us. And um, through a few courses I have been done so far, I see kind of very mixed audience who attends my uh, who attend my course. So I now in the process to really figure out who are our target, the most target audience. So I will focus on serving them. So now I see like business owner, we have business owner, we have corporate people, like new first manager level, we also have, um, how to say, freelance people. So it's quite really mixed mixed profile. So we have to decide uh, what kind of audience we really want to focus on this year. And also over that last month in February, Still, actually, this month, right? Uh, this month, we do um, recruitment uh, uh, enrollment for the course in March. I discovered the new market, so I'm gonna uh, create a new course to serve for that market as well. So, the objective for this year with Draft for Success is I need to create some new courses to serve for different, cu- um, different customer segments and needs, and then. Mm. Uh, and then see what are we, what's going on from there. Now, because of the 4.0, 4. I don't think too far, you know. Before I really try to this person, I always need a master plan to do thing I want. But now I really change the way I do. And the starting point is the thing I learned from Hawaii is that in the during the leadership course that I that we attended, you know, you know what I learned? I learned Try not to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and you learned that from? From Hawaii. In our little from Hawaii. In, I know. Yeah. Is there a specific uh, teacher or professor who was talking about that? Or was it from someone specific in our cohort? <laughs> I don't... I Sorry, I don't really recall where I get it from. But I remember like the... The biggest takeaway I text the biggest takeaway from how I need to sip cost is try not to be perfect because I am v grow and uh, and before I work for a bank I used to be a project manager and I created the whole process of new product in the bank and in the bank one thing you do so you the impact will be very huge to customer and to the bank itself. So everything needs to be perfect, 100%. So I, ca- I get used to this. And I really apply it in everything I do in life. And now, now today, uh, because of the development of new technology, of technology, so if you want to be, try to be perfect, sometimes we become, we can be, we can be left behind. And I, I don't want this. So I think I need to de- adapt a bit. Uh, of course, I'm still very careful person, a meticulous person. But at the same time, I need to change and to catch up. And I need to speed up with everything I do. 
and people recognize my speech and some a lot of people say wow <laughs> what you do during the covid pandemic even i don't recognize myself but my friends they see it and they ask me questions i said oh really that's what i did that i have been done. <laughs> you, <laughs> I, I, you adapted you adapted and yeah, you changed and yes sometimes i didn't recognize myself you know uh, because for the first two uh, training calls actually i did it within three that's th- uh, three weeks uh three weeks so Two weeks to recruit to recruit a new course for the new teacher, new trainer is very, very short, right? And no one gonna believe it until it happened. And and I just do. And then I I I didn't see much in terms of time. And when people ask me, oh, do you have a new course already? Yes, last week, or last Friday, or last Saturday. Then, but you just have another one a few weeks ago. Oh yes. So, and then we calculate together and it's actually three weeks. But I didn't think in my just three weeks. I just think, okay, I've, I finished this. So the next one will be it on that date, on that date. And then I did it. <laughs> and then I didn't recognize myself. And then until they told me, um, that's the way I do it now. So I don't, I don't think too far. I just go and then I just do whatever I can. I observe um, things surrounding me and I grab whatever opportunity I have. But of course, I need to prepare myself to be capable enough of grabbing that opportunity. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now I want to ask you this question. What? Uh, okay, I have so many questions to ask you actually. <laughs> but what, but what, what advice would you oh. give someone who wants to start, just say a fashion business like yours? Like what advice would you give to them? person and hopefully that person's a woman <laughs> <laughs> not a big question you know um and we need to put it in the um in the context of the country or the reason because yeah. in vietnam may be different and in asia or in europe can be different because in the vietnam now we have a lot of woman you know woman brand woman fashion brand and so in vietnam the uh, the culture is very diverse from the north to the south. A lot of successful brands in the north cannot enter the south market and vice versa. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Because we have a long country, about nearly 2,000 kilometers. So the culture is really different. We speak the same language, but the philosophy of people is different. Yeah, so... Um, Fashion, fashion this year is tough, but I always think in the difficulty is always review opportunity if you really observe what's going on and you find a niche, a niche to enter in. So it's similar to me. Uh, yeah, so in business, I've done fashion and other things as well. So I because of the thanks to COVID, honestly, thanks to COVID, uh, the new opportunity uh, comes out and I grab it. And uh, things become much better for me now. During the COVID time, sometimes I got um, depressed, though I never depressed in my life, very seldom. I can balance myself quite well. But during the first time of the COVID, because I didn't have anything to do, I say, oh my God, my life is really become disaster. <laughs> and... And, um, yeah, because of this, so I, I think deeper, I think deeper, I observe more and I find more opportunity. Yeah. So I think, uh, fashion is difficult this year, but there's still, there's still needs there. If you want to enter the market, you need to rec- uh, to to discover what it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can I ask you a question? What are you no longer afraid of? No longer afraid of. Wow. Yeah. No one asked me this question. <laughs> mm. I don't think of anything of it. You know, I don't have that thinking in mind because I prepare myself to face with any with anything. So I. Maybe I'm so optimistic, people. I never think of anything like kind of barrier because it really takes away our energy. So why you have to think about it? Yeah, that's the way I think. 
That's that's a that's also a very interesting answer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, a very interesting answer to me because di- different different guests have different opinions on it. So I I like your answer too. Okay, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Oh, ah, uh, we have a lot <laughs> <laughs> in Hawaii. You know, after you left Hawaii, I explored a lot in this island because I worked so hard during a week. When you went out, <laughs> so I, went, I spent another five days to explore the whole Hawaii when you left. So I tried to really dive into the ocean to observe shark in real life. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember you said oh, that. I, yes. I yes. My video. Yes. You yes. Video. Yes. The one that you said you went and uh, did a yeah. lot of interesting things also. Lah. I think you went to. You went to the beach, you drove around. I, I go snorkeling for the first time. Um, it's not a crazy thing, right? It's nothing to do. But shark is a really, really crazy thing to do. And my husband, actually, he didn't support it. I said, hey, we have to do it. It's a lifetime experience. I don't know whenever I can make it. Come so back let's, to, yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let, let's try it. But it's really scary, you know, because you are put in the ocean in a very big, I mean, uh, it's a cage. It's a cage, yeah. It's a cage, and actually, you can go to go to that barrier very easily. Oh, yeah. I see, it's so big, so they cannot get in. But like, you yeah. can go out if you want. You can to. touch the shark. You can touch the shark. <laughs> of course, I didn't do that. But you know, um, the brave thing I I did is so I. Did, some people may say it's crazy because you had a crazy question, right? A cra- a yeah. Crazy activity. Yeah. So it'd be crazy because like my son at the time, he is only uh, five, nearly six years old, right? So I took him, I sent him to a swimming uh, lesson uh, where he could not really swim. Yes, he can really float, but cannot really swim. And I also took him with me to the ocean to observe shark. At first, he was so scared and he didn't dare to really put his head down to the water to observe shark. But and then after some short conversation and he did it and he felt very happy. And, um, and it was amazing that one day he bring a picture from school back to our home and my husband and I were so surprised to see it because he draw a very long, um, long, long picture like this, and there are four, uh, four different scenery in this. One is about the um, the balloon. I took him to balloon in Turkey one time, and he he draw it. And the second experience is shark, right? Shark case. He also draw it. And the third one is the uh, the flight, also in Hawaii. Uh, I don't know the word in English. It is, is it para, para, paragliding? Is it paragliding? Yeah, yeah. Or parachuting. Is. Parachuting or something like that, right? Oh, oh, oh wait, wait, let me think. You go to the airplane without an engine. Yeah. I forget the word in English. Is it so, paraglide? Hmm, okay, but I, 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 I get it, yeah. It's how like this. So meaning like, I have a, um, I have a small, not airplane, it's smaller one, how do you say, um, helicopter, kind of mm. that. Mm. So I have a, a, a helicopter to take out up to the sky with a rope, and then they cut the rope, and then ours one fly with the wind. So mm. we, uh, we, uh, we uh, land and we fly with the wind, with our energy. So that's also a very nice experience. And my son, he also draw it uh, into his picture. And, uh, and another one, I forget what it is, but like the crazy thing we try in life. So he reflected into his painting. And actually for me, it feels also um, memorable. Um, and the thing I recognize that originally, I, I don't have that brave, bravery. I don't have that bravery, but as long as when I doing business, I become entrepreneur. I tend to take more risks 
I become more risky person and I enjoy that kind of challenges. Yeah, so that's why I try the new, very dangerous uh, spot, spot, and I enjoy it. I want to yeah. do it again someday. <laughs> Maybe when more day. To, to, to Hawaii, hopefully yeah. next year. We we yeah. can do it together. <laughs> oh, we can do it together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. okay. So we are almost at the end of our one hour. See, we yeah. had so much of fun, right? <laughs> so I'm going to ask you this final question. Um, what is that one key takeaway or one key thing that you want our listeners to remember from listening to our one hour conversation? Mm. from wow. Sophie <laughs> <laughs> that's a very interesting question but like I have so much to um, to think of and I don't know what I to spend to our audience uh, but you know I really love a saying from Lady Gaga when I watched her during the Oscar ceremony in 2019 because I see a lot of myself in her speech. And uh, she said that, like, all I have to say is that this is a hard work. She, she, she talked it when you received the Oscar, right? Uh, all I have to say is that this is hard work. I worked so hard for a long time, and it's not, it's not about winning. It's about not giving up. And I see that me also not giving up person. And if you have dream, fight for it. And that discipline for passion. And it's not about how many times you reject it or you fall down or you are beaten up. It's about how many times you stand up and you are brave and you keep on going. And this is also, um, I mean, the thing I would like to share with our audience, our audience because I think if you can really keep that attitude in line, so sooner or later you'll be successful. Yeah, because we are only very well educated people. And if we have a good attitude, we think uh, uh, optimistic about everything surrounding us, we will find opportunity and we will become very successful. And I wish our audience on the best block, uh, health and success in this new year. And thank you very much for hosting me. Um, it's very interesting uh, speech. <laughs> and I see that you've done a lot when we are back from Hawaii. Uh, yeah, you you have how many episodes you have now? So for the podcast, yeah, for the podcast of uh, well, once this episode is going up, this will be season two. Season two, so, so this yeah. season two already. So season one has already come and gone. Uh, mm. Each season is thirteen episodes. So right. yeah, yeah. Okay, final, final, final question before I let you go. Is where can people find you and connect with you if they want to know more about you or your brand? My, um, huh, I have so many addresses. <laughs> For my fashion business, so we have a website, um, worldwide.scabella.com. Uh, um, Salino, we have a website more in Vietnamese, and um, we more based more on the corporate relationship, so we don't really develop a website. For the Dread for Success, people can find me on the Facebook. Uh, that's the Dread for Success. Uh, and maybe search my name, Sophie Hang Nguyen. Uh, they may find me because like in the fan page, we have both Vietnamese and um, English and English name. I'm going to open the new community very soon, early March. Yeah, the like closed group for that topic as well. Now we I have fan page so people can search track for success. Okay. So and uh, are you also on LinkedIn? LinkedIn, I had I haven't been active for quite a while. Before when I had a hat hand comedy, um I was very active, but now I, I'm not because there's so much to handle already. <laughs> so yes, yes, I'm not definitely. I mean, with yeah. each new uh, social media, each new platform, we're all, you know, trying our best to catch up, right? Yeah. So thank you so much, uh Sophie, for a wonderful uh time. Uh, I know you, but at the same time, I don't know you. 
<laughs> you know, if it makes sense, because I, okay, this is a little backstory for those of you who are listening is that I met Sophie when we were both in Hawaii. And that was in July 2019. And that's how we became friends. And you yeah. see, friends do things together years on after the first encounter. So when uh, the pandemic lockdowns, just before the pandemic lockdown started in Malaysia in 2020, see, I have to think of the years because it's in like March, right? in March. Yeah, right? in March. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I was actually visiting her in Ho Chi Minh uh, with another friend from the Philippines who is also featured on my podcast. So if you are interested in that, go and check out Norhani Pakasum's uh, episode in season one. So uh, Nor and Sophie are both in the fashion business. And we thought of it as an ASEAN gathering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Ho Chi Minh City. So that time it wasn't locked down yet. So, but we managed to get back home in time before our individual countries border closed. So that was this is a little bit backstory, a little bit of an interesting thing because some of you may wonder why is Sophie talking about Hawaii <laughs> and what is how how does Hawaii feature in this we episode? Talk so, about it, right? <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about Hawaii. So yeah. Hawaii is that place we had to each fly so many many hours to get to that island in the middle of the Pacific, and uh, that's where we uh, took part in a leadership uh, course from the East West Center. So, yes, thank you once more, Sophie, for uh, referencing Hawaii and all the wonderful, uh, cool memories that we have there. So when yeah. she was saying that she was working in her room, uh, yeah, the rest of us were just going out for dinner. We went shopping. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, she was very dedicated. She was very disciplined. She had to spend her time doing the work in her room while all of us went out at night. <laughs> so that's that's the story. So thank you so much again, uh, Sophie, for your time. And I really wish you all the best in your business because I think that um, what you have done in the last, I don't know, even not even one year, it's not even one year, right? Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, because from the yeah. from the pandemic lockdown to your retail business, uh, you know, having having to close temporary and then finding a new way out of that darkness into a new business and a collaboration. And so many more new things are coming up. Yeah, you just, remind, you just reminded me. It, it's now a year, officially a year. Because I remember yeah. last time it's about March, right? About early March. Yeah. And now yeah. it's nearly end of February already. So it's nearly a year now. You reminded yeah. me. So yeah. we look back. So fast. Things, so fast. Right? Yeah. So fast and a lot of things happen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hopefully so, we we will. I can visit you very soon this year. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. know. <laughs> yeah. We're so near yet so far, right? We're so yeah. near yet so far. <laughs> yeah. And okay. Best of luck with your podcast as well and your other business. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. We'll see you again. Thank you very much for your listening, uh, everyone, and hopefully that we can catch up another time, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. You can find all the links and show notes on our website, womenprintasia.com. If you have enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. If you're sharing this on your social media, please use the hashtag WomenPrinterAsia. In next week's episode, I'll be speaking to Malaysian entrepreneur Shadatu Intan. He's the director of Profound Learning Solutions Sindiram Berhad, a training company. She's also a certified EQ assessor, mindfulness and NLP practitioner. Intan, as she's fondly known, was able to quickly embrace the changes of the new norm and pivoted from face-to-face -face training to virtual training and has managed to attract regional and global attendees to her workshops. If you want to hear Intan's story, check out our episode next week.